All right. Well, welcome everyone. Today is my first day of uh, the National Invasive Species Awareness Week. I am Christy Trifone Milhouse, NASMA's Executive Director, and I'm glad to have you all with us today. The North American Invasive Species Management Association is committed to our mission of empowering the management of invasive species in North America. Over the last few years, our organization has grown by leaps and bounds as we continue to expand programming in ways our founding members never thought possible. NASMA works to create bridges across geographic divides and jurisdictions in North America. We connect land and water resource managers and professionals by developing and supporting international standards, consistent messaging, and promoting tools and trainings that support your work. It is our mission and our job to support all of you. Here are just a few program opportunities that NASMA offers. If you're not currently a member, we hope you will consider joining us. Before we start today's webinar, I would like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors for helping to make the National Invasive Species Awareness Week, or known as NISA, uh, make this week a reality. So we're looking forward to growing this programming in 2024 and we'll be reaching out to new partners in the coming years, so stay tuned. As you can see, we have an exciting agenda for this week. You can register at nisa.org to participate in the week's events. We have an events page there that captures other events going on in the nation, a toolkit for you to use to customize social media posts for your own platforms, and a take action page on our policy page. Lots of exciting things happening this week. We're so glad to have you all. And now I am going to turn it over uh, to our Government Relations Director, Elizabeth Brown, who will introduce Yolanda, our speaker. Thanks again. All right. I apologize for the sound issues. Okay, so now I would like to introduce Yolanda, who is an invasive species specialist with Cannabio. She's been there for over 15 years. Uh, she has a master's degree in conservation biology from the University of Kent and a specialization in science communications. She has participated in the development of the Mexican strategy for the control of invasive species and in the publication of the first invasive species list for Mexico, which included developing with a group of experts an invasiveness risk assessment methodology specific for her country. Her work includes the update of the Invasive Species Information Database, carrying out risk assessments, working with other governmental and academic institutions in the development of invasive species programs across the country. She is co-author of several book chapters on invasive species, and she consistently participates in workshops and forums on the topic. In recent years, she has been heavily involved with the development of communication materials and campaigns on invasive species for the general public. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing and let you share your screen. Um, for those watching, if you have questions, we will save our Q&A till after the presentation. And so um, you have a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Go ahead and put your questions in there. Um, and uh, if you see a question that's already been asked, there's a little thumbs up that you can click, and that will promote that question to the top of the box for us. All right. That Thank looks you. great. Thank you. And you can hear me well, right? I can. I can see okay. you and hear you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is really exciting for me to be here and to be able to share with all of you um, everything we've been doing in Mexico in the past few years. Um, I think we've grown a lot. Um, just to uh, let you know how it all started, um, we started around the 50s um, with uh, the Animal and Plant Health Commissions focused, of course, on more uh, productive sectors. Um, then until the 80s, uh, the Urban and Development uh, and Equal Urban Development and Ecology Secretary was formed. Then in 1990, we had our first uh, general environmental law. 
uh, CONAVIO, which is where I work, the National Commission on uh, Knowledge and Use of Biodiversity, was formed in 1992 together with the Ministry of, um, of Environment. For the first time, we had organizations uh, focused on, on the environment. And then uh, in uh, 2000 was uh, when we had our first general wildlife law, as well as the Protected Areas Commission. Uh, then in 2006, we had our own national millennium ecosystem assessment sort of thing, the same study. Uh, so we were able to determine, uh, as well as the millennium ecosystem assessment did, our main um, biodiversity laws uh, drivers. Uh, and in Mexico, invasive species was found to be the third uh, driver of biodiversity laws, as, as opposed to uh, in other parts of the world, which is um, the second one. And of course, on islands, it was also the first one, same as everywhere else. So continuing with the story, in 2006, in addition to this um, study, we also had the invasion of the cactus moth in the Yucatan Peninsula. So that was a, a big eye-opener to, um, to see that this was a really huge problem that could cause a lot of um, economic losses as well as biodiversity losses. Mexico is um, in a home to many endemic uh, cactus species. And of course we eat cactus, it's part of our culture, it's on our flag. So the fact that uh, the cactus moth was in Mexico was uh, very scary. The Yucatan Peninsula is not a rich area for uh, cactus. So we were able to eradicate it. And it also showed the importance of working together with other organizations because it, it came into a protected area. So the Protected Areas Commission came into play, um, the Ministry of Environment, local authorities, um, as well as agricultural authorities, because as I said, we, we eat cactus here. So there are uh, fields of cactus for um, consumption. And then after this, um, in 2007, then Conavi decided to uh, start a specific area for invasive species, which is where I am at. So from 1992, where Conavi started, it was until 2007 that we actually started working specifically on invasive species. Uh, then in 2010, we, uh, we published our invasive species strategy for Mexico, and the wildlife law was modified to include the definition of invasive species and certain general actions that should be taken. Um, no mention of invasive species ex existed before 2010 in our law. Uh, and one of the changes was that uh, it stated that Mexico should have a list of invasive species. So this happened in 2016 when we published our invasive species list. And then in 2014, um, we started uh, with a um, GEF funded project for invasive species that helped us put into place a lot of what was in the in the strategy. So as I said, I work in Conavio. Conavio is um, the repository of the National Information System on Biodiversity. We are uh, an institution that's unique in the world. Uh, we have we gather all the information related to biodiversity in one single um, database. So the objective is to gather this information and work sort of as a, as a link between um, the academy, the, the institutions that are um, researching this information, and we transform it into uh, information that can be understood and, um, and used by policymakers and decision makers from society to, uh, to laws and, and everyone who's involved in, in decisions related to biodiversity. Um, this is uh, our invasive species strategy. Um, there were a lot of uh, participants, which was also important because um, institutions tend to work very separately in Mexico in many ways. And of course, invasive species is a topic that involves um, marine, uh, agriculture, universities, the pet industry, everybody. So it was very important to get all these organizations to work together. And um, the objectives, it has five uh, actions and three general objectives and many goals related to these, but um, basically the, the objectives are related to prevention, control, and also communication on, to anyone who's involved. Um, 
Then, as I said, luckily, we were very scared that the strategy would end up just being a paper on uh, people's bookshelves. But uh, we managed to get funding from uh, GEF to uh, start a, a GEF project in invasive species. Um, all of these organizations uh, participated, a lot from federal government, some from state government, some universities, some NGOs. Um, overall, uh, over 350 products came out, and I will go through um, the, the things that we did with the GEF project. And also some have been with funding from the GEF project, others not necessarily, but the GEF project certainly helped us uh, push all the activities uh, for invasive species control in Mexico. Uh, so these were the components, the general components of the GEF project. Component, the first component was general national uh, management framework. And I'll go through each of these and the things that we did. And the second one was uh, to protect vulnerable ecosystems from uh, invasive species. Okay, so the first, um, the first component, the first part of the first component is tools aimed at providing information for decision making. So this is when uh, Gonabio comes in a lot because we hold the information. So we wanted to make sure that everybody could get it. The information that we have in our um, information system for invasive species, of course, we have a lot more information for native species. And that's basically what Gonabio worked on from its start all the way now. Uh, invasive species is just one area. Uh, our list of species of interest is almost 3,000. Uh, we have over 600 maps, 600,000 600, records for um, exotic and invasive species that are present in the country. Uh, we've been working on information sheets and on risk assessments. Uh, these species that I mentioned, uh, as you can see, most of them are plants. On the left, we have the ones that we call species of interest because we're in, they haven't been classified officially as invasive, but some are, most are exotic. There are some natives that have been moved to different parts of the country, but we have yet to analyze them and evaluate whether they should be classified as invasive or not. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's an invasion going on, but according to the risk assessment. Uh, the ones that have been classified as invasive species, independently of whether they are in the country yet or not, are um, 650. And again, most of them are plants. Fish is a big component because uh, we had a project for um, risk assessment of fish. That's why there are a lot. Um, so it's related a little bit to the amount, uh, the number of, of species for these groups, but also the amount of work that has been done because of the importance um, and the problems that they are causing in, in Mexico. So in order to do these risk assessments uh, and to produce the list that was uh, published in the official newspaper, we uh, came up with a, a rapid risk assessment methodology um, and 50 experts work on this. It's a very uh, short methodology. It's 10 questions. And with this, we published our first official list in 2016. It has uh, three, 360 species and it's, it's a good, it's a good list for our, our first effort. It's supposed to be updated every three years. It's 2023 and we still haven't updated it. So this is definitely something that we need to work on. Um, and it's just a list. So it still needs management actions. What, what are you supposed to do with, with these species? So it's, it's, uh, well, it's our first approach to, to this effort, but it still needs a lot of work. Um, and as, it, as I said, as of now we have, well, uh, over 650 invasive species. So the list is now um, a little bit behind. And also uh, there are no fish in this, in this um, list. Fish and the forestry related um, species were not included because according to the law that falls under someone else's jurisdiction. So this is also where we come up with uh, problems of, of who whose jurisdiction it is and maybe some gaps in the legislation that need to be addressed. And um, that's also why we start working on fish as a separate uh, project. Uh, in Mexico, we have uh, 550 native species of fish and 240 exotic species of fish. So we have a lot. Um, we have one little state here that has a lot of um, farms for ornamental fish. And there have been uh, a lot of escapes there. 98% of all ornamental fish are produced in this little state. 
Um, and if you go and collect fish in the rivers of that state, 65% of the fish that you would collect would be exotic. So it's a huge problem. Um, and that's why we have been working a lot on, on the risk assessments and uh, some of the other work that I'll tell you about soon. Uh, we also did some um, full risk assessments using, using different methodologies for those species that the little 10 question risk assessment wouldn't be enough in case of species that are uh, commercially important or that are um, imported and exported. There wasn't enough certainty with the 10 question approach to determine whether they would should be classified as invasive or not. So this is also a lot of the things that we've been working on lately. And we've been working on the identification of pathways, entry pathways to Mexico using the um, classification from the CBD. And this information is mostly from literature. So we also need to work with border um, uh, control officers to see, uh, to get more uh, actual information on what is happening uh, on land in, in, in real life. Uh, but we have covered most of the pathways for, for the species on the official list. Uh, the information that we have in the information, the information on the information system uh, is, has recently been posted on this webpage, which is the barometer of biodiversity. And uh, currently Mexico and Chile have updated their, their information. Um, so you can find a lot of statistics and numbers and graphs and everything for all the data that we have on, on invasive species for taxonomic group, for environment, uh, over time, category, uh, in protected areas, in the whole country. It's a very uh, good source of information. And this, we are just, uh, we just came out with this a uh, couple of months ago. We're still working on it, but it's a very good source of very detailed information for people who are, are looking for, for this. Um, as part of the GEF project, some other uh, products that came out were uh, climate change scenarios for 60 species of plants. Uh, also, uh, risk maps, maps for forestry pests and with this uh, handbook for uh, reforestation with native species that was uh, is being used by the Forestry Commission now. Uh, there was also a project on identification of um, invasive water plants all over Mexico. These are the, the top ones that were found. Uh, so it's also a handbook for the uh, to identify them for people on the field. Um, and well, that was for tools, information tools. The second part of this component was uh, regulation in productive sectors. So working more. Uh, well, with, uh, for example, cattle producers and with ornamental fish producers were two of the big groups that we work with. Uh, the objective was, of course, to minimize their impacts. And uh, both groups really took it, um, they, they took the topic very seriously and their work. And I, I like this picture on the left a lot because you can see how they themselves made their their uh, own banner. They, they drew the logos uh, of the government organizations that were participating and everything. So they were really interested in this. Uh, there's plans for uh, maybe a future certification um, and well, best practices in the use of uh, foraging species, which is of course a source of, of um, invasive species. And then ornamental fish producers, as I said, this is a huge problem in a lot of water bodies. A lot of people uh, work in this industry. So it, it, at first it wasn't easy to get across them. There's in general, uh, sort of, um, they don't like it when you say, oh, I'm with government and I'm here to talk to you. They're like, no, you're here to find me. You're here to close my factory. I'm gonna need extra permits. It, it's gonna cost me a lot more money. So it was a little bit hard at first, but um, through uh, several talks and training, they realized that it was also to prevent losses for them. Um, if the fish were accidentally released and people could just go and get fish from the rivers and then they wouldn't be able to sell them anymore. Um, but there is a need for financial support because these are, of course, uh, organizations that don't have a lot of money and they already have a lot of permits that they need. So if you just say, oh, well, just put a net around your pond, it's relatively simple for us, but for them it's like, yeah, where do I get the money? So um, 
a lot of a lot of these things are as always easier said than done. Um, and then the third part of this component was uh, strengthening the multi-sectoral sectoral framework. So working with other or, um, government organizations, uh, such as, for example, the um, environmental attorney, they are the ones that are in the borders checking um, the trucks that come in. Um, they didn't have a lot of equipment. Through, so through the GEF project, they were able to purchase some microscopes. And they were very, very excited about that. Um, we had some workshops with them to, to talk about uh, gaps in the legislation that needed to be addressed and their experiences actually uh, in ports and airports. Then we also uh, had a closer cooperation with the Ministry of Agriculture, which was very important because, well, they started from the 50s and 60s doing uh, all their inspections, so they have a lot of experience and well there's also more financing for this for this sector because uh what we depends on them so they have already in place a lot of inspection systems a lot of uh, inspectors that are working in the field to to find pests and diseases that are important for agriculture but of course a lot of them are also important for um for biodiversity so um they can they can help us with the system that they already have in place uh, and these are some of the examples of the pests that they check because they're important to uh, the agriculture sector or, or the um, cattle sector or well, not these ones but um and they are also in our invasive species list and they are important um they would they would cause a lot of damage if they came in um, we also had some group sessions to try to uh, install an incident command system with other um, government officials, government uh, agencies. Um, so this was really good because yes, we we tended to work each agency in their own in their own little world. Uh, and the fact that we got to meet and work together, um, I think there's there's still a need to to strengthen the the official collaboration between the institutions. Sometimes it comes down to, I'm, I'm going to call this person because I know he can help me, but, but there is still lacking, um, well, MOUs and uh, agreements to actually um, make this more official, that institutions will collaborate together um, if there is a detection of an invasive species that comes in, who, who has to actually go and run and eradicate it. Um, we also had a couple of workshops with um, um, newspaper people and with congressmen. Um, the one with the newspaper people was really, uh, really a success. Um, this little video here on, on the right is a, a small video uh, put on TV. It was like a five minute thing. And I was interviewed for this video. I came out, I was interviewed for like 10 minutes. I came out on video for like 30 seconds. And the weekend after it came out, I went to, uh, to eat tacos in a place and the person who was sell telling taco selling tacos immediately said to me, aren't you the lady who speaks on TV about um, uh, invasive species? And this was about soccer mouth catfish. And he was like, that fish is so ugly and it's terrible. But it was as if I had my weekly show, right? Like you're the person that comes on TV to talk about inv invasive species. So I think it worked well. Um, and we need more of this. We need people to to learn about this topic um, and and find out what they can do. Um, the workshop with the congressmen, there were about 20 congressmen and more like the representatives that came, but it was also a, a, a very good first step. So we also need to get them more involved and more interested. Um, again, the, the newspaper workshop worked really well. And in um, 2020, when we had the giant wasp problem, uh, as did the US and, and Canada. Uh, there were over 2,000 newspaper articles that came out. And people, of course, they went overboard. We were getting, as of course, in, in the US and Canada. So we were getting reports every day about people finding them all over the house. Um, but at least uh, we got some interest uh, and people were responding. So um, it, it was a good result. And we've also worked with other countries. Uh, we worked with um, Uruguay, helping them with their risk assessment. They were just starting with their risk assessments. So we had some uh, online meetings with them and they are now using a similar method to the 10 question ones that we used for their assessments. Uh, component two about vulnerable ecosystems. 
Um, the first uh, vulnerable ecosystem was islands, and Mexico has done a lot of work on islands. We have over 4,000 islands in the country. And even though they're only 0.3% of the country surface, they hold over 8% of all vertebrate and plant species. And a lot of these are endemic, um, and they are very important breeding sites, resting sites for different, uh, different species. Uh, and well, as I said, as in the rest of our world, invasive species on islands are the first cause of um, uh, extinctions. Uh, so this organization, Island Conservation, they are in Ensenada and they do excellent work. Uh, some of it was funded through the GEF project. They also get funding from um, other sources. Bonavio has funded some of their projects. So we work with them a lot. And they uh, managed to remove over 60 populations of invasive mammals on 39 islands, 11 species, cats, rats, goats. Uh, they've installed biosecurity plants. They do campaigns with the fishermen, the local people. And here's an example of um, Guadalupe Island, which as you can see, in 2003, there were practically no trees is because of the goats. And after the goats were eradicated, uh, three species of, of trees, of endemic trees, one of them was thought to be extinct, the, the Guadalupe uh, pine. Uh, it was, the seeds, the seeds were still viable in the soil, so they started, as soon as the goats were eliminated, the trees started uh, growing again, and um, well, it's, it's been going really well. Um, and well, uh, Mexico, this recent article by uh, Spatz uh, says, uh, listed Mexico as the sixth country with the highest percentage of contribution to eradication around the world. So on island eradication, we are doing very, very well. Um, this other component with protected areas um, was in nine pilot protected areas with the GAP project, but all protected areas have been working also on invasive species. And these are some of the examples of things they did. Um, EDRR protocols, uh, some eradication activities, also trying to involve the local communities um, by uh, eradication activities or by even working on the on the plan to eradicate the the, the species. So, so actually becoming part of the whole process, not just the last hand handwork, but everything. Um, these are some some examples of of species and areas that were uh, cleared in some of the protected areas. And recently uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula, they, um, they brought out the program for the control of lionfish. And this is, it's in the top three of uh, invasions, biological invasions in Mexico, uh, not just in Mexico, all over the Caribbean and even to South America, Florida. Um, so they've been working very hard since it appeared the fishermen have been, um, removing the lionfish, they've been doing different things, they've been doing, um, using it for food, jewelry, I am wearing lionfish earrings, um, but there wasn't an, uh, an official document that said this is how we're doing it, um, so they just published this last week, uh, this is brand new, and the idea is to keep promoting collaboration, improving the legal institutional framework, again lionfish is not on the official list of invasive species, so um, this all needs needs work because it's been doing a it's been local uh, work from fishermen and the fishermen's wives who are the ones who make the the earrings, uh, but there need there needs to be more uh, uh, federal support, which there is from the protected area commission, but just the, this program will strengthen everything that they've already been doing. In terms of communication, we've been also been working a lot. Uh, we started a new web page in 2020. Uh, we thought it was a good idea to use a non-government URL. As I said, people sometimes don't like government things, so we just have invasive.mx, but it takes you to our government website. Once you're there, it's by um, biodiversidad.gov. Uh, also, citizen science is something that has grown a lot in the past few years. Mexico is the eighth country in the world with most social media users. Um, these are the percentages of what people use. So Facebook is the number one. Um, and a lot of people just use it uh, on a mobile phone. So the app for iNaturalist, which is uh, what we've been promoting in Mexico, has been very successful. Uh, the number of observers, species, and observation has 
grown a lot since 2013 when we started promoting this app. Um, in terms of invasive species, uh, we have over 600,000 records. Uh, but as you can see, uh, as of last year, about half was cannabis projects, but a lot uh, was already from my naturalist. And this is from eBird. The yellow one is eBird. So a lot is from citizen science. Um, we also have this new web page, uh, Encyclopedia is Life, so Encyclopedia of Life, uh, where you can search um, by all these categories. Uh, and we have all the invasive species information here. We have the, uh, all the records that have appeared. Uh, we also have, you can search by use. So a lot of the invasive species uh, that are on Encyclopedia already have they use for ornamental purposes or um, um, for food or, or whatever. Um, an interesting thing, I think, is that one of the things we focus is the common name of the species. It's not just in Spanish, it's also in English and other languages, but Mexico has over 68 indigenous languages that are still spoken by over six, 7 million people. So we've been trying to um, put the names of the species in, in local languages, which I think is really good. We've generated a lot of communication material, um, and all of this is uh, online in what we call the, the bioteca. We have YouTube videos, uh, infographies, and some of these, again, were produced with GEF funding, and some ha we had been working on uh, before, but this is now all available, and it's for different levels, very technical to just very general. This is uh, um, the, the game, board games, which... Uh, I have, I have here, no, if you're looking at me in the little screen, but this is uh, the box of games and we have them online also. You can download a lot of things from the webpage. Um, we have a webpage for kids. There's games, there's videos, there's interviews. These are all um, species that you can, that, that this uh, little girl that is our spokesperson, Luna, she interviewed the cat and the uh, um, the Miopsita, the, the, the parrot, uh, and these other things. So you can listen to their interview in Spanish. We also do in-person um, communication and outreach to different groups whenever they invite us. We are very happy to do that. Um, and of course, the Invasive Species uh, Week which is something that we just joined in 2018, but we've been doing that. And this week, there will be things published in social media for us. And we also recently joined the Play Klingo uh, Awareness Campaign. So we're also working on, on that and trying translating some things and adapting a lot of the activities that are maybe uh, done a lot in the US and Canada. Maybe they're not something that Mexican society does a lot. So adapting uh, the activities that, that um, disperse invasive species in, in Mexico. What do we need to do in the future? Well, we would like to continue with the progress that we obtained with the GEF project. It finished in 2019 and we had the 2020 COVID and we just did things online, but uh, it, it has to continue. All the field work that, that happened should continue. Uh, Konavi will continue working as a bridge and uh, helping uh, translate and move the, the information between all the sectors. We need to strengthen the legal framework. The, the list is something that has to be worked on uh, and public policies and uh, strengthening all the local activities that are, that are being done. Um, well, finding common ground among economic, social and ecological priorities, of course. Communication is very important. And, uh, I think it has helped a lot of this uh, material that we've done and increasing responsibility with with all the stakeholders. This is the beginning of a YouTube video that's 30 seconds long. And I, oh, there it is. Maybe I'll, I'll, let's see if I, let's see if it works. I don't know if, I think I shared my audio. Seres vivos poseen características que les permiten vivir en equilibrio con su medio ambiente. Pero cuando las transportamos para llevarlas a otro ecosistema, estas especies se consideran exóticas. Muchas de ellas no logran adaptarse y no sobreviven. Pero otras pueden establecerse y afectar a las especies que ya habitan ahí incluso hasta provocar su extinción. Estas son conocidas como especies exóticas invasoras. 
En México se han registrado cerca de 300 de ellas y provocan un daño estimado en cerca de 60 mil millones de dólares cada año. Entra en invasoras.mx para conocer más sobre cómo conservar nuestra riqueza natural. And uh, that's it for me. Uh, these are all our web pages that you can go into, uh, the kids one and, and our email, uh, where we answer all types of questions from all, uh, everyone from students, high school, high school students, university students, policymakers. We review all the laws that are changed. So anything that you need, you can contact us. Thank you so much. That was an outstanding presentation. Oh my gosh, there's just an, a plethora of amazing work going on. We so appreciate you sharing. And um, there's lots of um, comments in the chat. Um, awesome work. Everybody loves the kids' activities and the kids' web pages. Uh, folks are really interested in the games and uh, some of the tools that you that you have on there. We do have some questions for you, but again, lots of praise and thanks um, in the chat for a great presentation. So uh, we do have a question. Uh, is there um, an exotic species working group in Mexico that people can join? Mm, or that maybe organizations can join? Yeah, well, since the strategy was formed, there is a, a committee of organizations that we have been working together. That was 2010. So things have been changing. Um, uh, some of them have been lost along the way, but yes, Conavio interacts with all of the organizations. So we are still uh, sort of a, a group, an invasive species group. Uh, it, it was formed as an official invasive species committee. Uh, I don't know if someone could just join as an individual. No, that we don't have a group like that. As an organization, uh, maybe we could... Uh, if it was national, for sure. I mean, anyone who wants to join the committee, great. If it's international, um, I don't know. But we are also uh, involved with NASMA and these other organizations. Come join us, everybody. Uh, uh, not exactly like that, but it's not a bad idea. So I see you have an email up on your screen. If there are organizations um, attending today from Mexico that would like to connect um, and potentially participate or have a conversation about what that would look like, is that the right email for them to um, to ping and, and maybe ask some questions about that? Yes, exactly. Sometimes I give talks in universities and they tell me, oh, your data is missing this and this. I'm like, well, tell us. I can't go to all the universities and say, can you check my list? Can you check my list? So everything's online. If you see something that is needs uh, changing or you have additional information, or you, and it's, yes, this is the, the email and we are always very happy when, when people contact us. Okay, great. Um, can anyone submit an MERI for an invasive species? Yes. Uh, yeah, we will look at it and check it. And depending, we could maybe contact, depending on who sends it to us, we can contact uh, an expert on, on the species or on the group. Because, well, in here, we are two people <laughs> in invasive species in Conavio, so we are not experts on everything, of course. So depending on what it is and the, uh, what the species and the information. Uh, but yes, I mean, they help us. If they send us something that's already made, they, they help us a lot. Okay, great, great. Okay. Um, are there rapid response funds available that organizations can apply for in order to um, try to eradicate populations before they become um, problem infestations? Do you have like a grant program or is there a grant program in Mexico for rapid response? Well, for example, well, the, the agriculture secretary, yes, they, they have funding for okay. anything that, that uh, comes up and they have uh, the inspectors that go immediately and the funds to eradicate it and stop it. The environmental ministry is a little bit more limited and that's why we've been trying to, to join forces with them. Um, because it is more focused on uh, agriculture and pests and diseases uh, and that. But if it's something that they can help with, then it will, they will do it with their funding. If another organization wants to get funding, then I, I'm, I don't think so. Yes, there isn't a, an actual fund. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, can people um, use, uh, it, it looks like there is a, an event in Oxnard, California, Bug Fest coming up in June, and they would love to share some of your kids' information from your, your website. Is that okay for folks to yes. be able to use that and share? Yes, yes, it's free for, okay. for yeah, we'd be happy to hear that the users, so if you can, they can send us fit pictures and let us know they're using it, uh, that'll make me very happy. So yes. Okay, good. Yeah, if they need the high definition things, they can contact us and we can send them the files, like the the games <laughs> I'm going to show again. Um, we have them in, in high definition. So if they want to print giant cards or giant um, things, board games to, to print, we can help them with that too. Good, good. Okay, awesome. Yeah, those games are exciting. I can't wait to get them and play with my family. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, what was the driving factor behind the deforestation of Guadalupe Island? Was it herbivory by invasive species? Yes, it was goats. Yes, and it started since the early 1900s when goats first were first put in the in the on the island, so fishermen could have something to eat while while they got there and things like that. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Well, that's all of our questions for today. If there's any more questions, go ahead and um, drop it in the um, in the Q&A. Otherwise, we will wrap up here. Um, I want to again thank Yolanda for being here and giving us such an incredibly informative perspective on the variety of different things going on um, across the country of Mexico. We greatly appreciate your time and expertise and energy today. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Yolanda. I know uh, several of us were wondering where to get those awesome earrings. Can we connect with you to get a pair? Yes, uh, it's earrings and it's also the uh, the necklace. So yes. That's fantastic. Um, I yeah, would love some, to connect with you over that. A tiny, tiny community, but I, I did get their email and number. So we'll, we would see how to get them. But yes, they would be very happy, I'm sure. Great. All right. For everybody watching, don't forget we have webinars all week this week. So go to nisa.org, take a look and register for events either hosted by NASMO or a, a ton of other organizations across the continent this week. Um, and don't forget to use hashtag NISA on social media. Um, any final comments, Christy or Yolanda, before we wrap it up today? Just a big thank you to Yolanda for all the work that she's done and helping to lead the way. Uh, really in in Mexico and we look forward to continuing our partnership with you and uh, we'll be excited to see many of you back here tomorrow for our webinar presentation and uh, thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye now.